Hello everyone and welcome to episode 18-ish of uh, Magic the Judging where we teach you to be a better judge and in this episode um, I'm going to be talking pretty much solely about the, uh, I'm just going to adjust my camera, um, the, the the things that happened in the Cardiff PTQ weekend. Um, it was a good fun. First PTQ uh, of the season that had M13 legal. And I'm very happy to report that there were no Battle of Wits decks to be seen. So there you go. Um, I'm actually slightly sad there were no Battle of Wit de Wits decks to be seen, to be fair. I played at the FNM the night before and uh, me and two other guys from work all bought brought Battle of Wits decks and uh, the Battle of Wits mirror that I had was absolutely the funniest game of standard I think I've played for a long time. Uh, involved Thrun and a removal spell that caused it to be sacrificed and there was Grizzlebrand and Grizzlebrand got mind controlled and everyone drew lots of cards and the mind control got destroyed and the Grizzlebrand went back to its original owner and there was all more and more cards drawn and did anyone draw a tutor or a Battle of Wits? No, we just played Primeval Titan and it got wrathed and then Planeswalkers came down and oh, it was epic, absolutely epic and that was standard, beautiful, beautiful match. And then of course I got completely trolled by a white weenie deck that had one drops, but never mind, that's, that's how it happens. Um, so, yes, um, first of all, before I get on with today's episode, I've, really, I, I've got to apologise for not being around for the last two weeks. Um, last week I was all set up to go um, and was so utterly shattered when I came home from work. I thought, hey, well, I don't know, I'll have a bit of a power nap before I get on and start streaming. And power nap turned into an actual proper sleep. I just had to text uh, text Kim and Gareth and go, I am so I'm a zombie. I'm a zombie. Target Paul is in bed and is a zombie in addition to his other creature types. Um, so, sorry for missing that one. And the one before that, uh, I had a random singing rehearsal I wasn't expecting because we had a concert that week, uh, which went down very well. And there's vague evidence uh, of it on probably on YouTube actually but on the Medina Community Choir website certainly there's some uh, video evidence of my of my singing career in its infancy but enough of that enough of all that I have let you down enough with a lack of magic content and we're back so what happened what actually happened at the card of PTQ well I made I made some notes as I was as I was judging. Um, actually, not that many notes. But the, the things that came up, whilst there weren't too many of them, I, I think there were some highly interesting ones in here. So um, please let me know in the chat if you think I have moved on past a subject a bit quick. Is that Jason Savage? Jason PS1972 coming into the chat there. So, oh. Hello. Hello. Very nice to see you. Well... As I said to Gareth the other day, you, you kind of see me. All, all I get to do is is read your text. That's cool. Anyway. So, yes, I have these notes. I've got some card images to go through, and we'll see what happened. So, um, during, the, during the first couple of rounds, I had uh, my two floor judges. I had Pip Griffiths, who's uh, who done an absolutely stunning job of covering the floor for me. Um, and Andrew Quinn, who uh, I'm pleased to announce passed his level two test with me. Um, they were checking all the deck lists and uh, making sure everything was in order. So I actually got the majority of the floor coverage, which is, to be honest, the bit of judging I like the most. So um, I was quite happy to get all the calls I did. Uh, one of the first ones I got was to do with this guy. We had a phantasmal image. And in fact, we had two phantasmal images. A uh, phantasmal image and an inmate, the other phantasmal image. Um, the first phantasmal image... So, am I making you dizzy by moving the cards in and out? Bet you I am. Um, the first Phantasmal image had come into play copying a Restoration Angel. Or, uh, as I've, I've begun to pick up the slang here, everyone's just calling it Resto. Oh, I did this, and he did that, and then I Restoed, and he countered. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm word. I am up with the slang. So, there's a Resto the other side of the board, and Phantasmal Image comes in and copies the resto, and, well, there's, there's nothing for it to do. But then they were concerned. When the second Phantasmal Image came in um, as, as another Restoration Angel, uh, it's got a triggered ability which says, when it enters the battlefield, you may exile target non-angel creature you control. Now, what they knew 
what they knew, um, which was actually one of the one of the trickier parts to do with um, targeted but optional trigger abilities, is that they knew that um, it triggers uh, regardless of whether you're intending to use the ability or not. So you you have to target a non-angel if you've got one, even if where it says you may exile it, even if you're actually going to decline to exile it when the triggered ability resolves, at the point that it triggers and you've got to put it on the stack, you do have to target a non-angel. But in this case, there were no non-angel um, cards around because the only other card he controlled was the other Phantasmal image, which was doing its best impression of a Restoration Angel himself, and therefore it was a Restoration Angel. And um, so they were wondering, uh, do I have to target it anyway? Um, and then like the triggered ability gets countered or something, um, which obviously they were quite concerned about because Phantasmal Image has a has a nasty habit of being uh, being sacrificed if you so much as sneeze in his direction. So um, yeah, that was the first ruling, um, and I've given you plenty of time to think about it whilst I've been bumbling along. So I'll just go ahead and say no. If a, if a triggered ability is going to go on the stack and there are no legal targets for it, then it just doesn't go on the stack. Um, it's tempting to say it goes on the stack and gets countered or goes on the stack and doesn't do anything or something like that, but it actually just doesn't happen. It, it doesn't ever make it to the stack. Um, so there you go. Actually, am I wrong? Does it technically go on the stack and get ripped straight back off again when you realise there's no targets? It might be that. Subtly different to what I just said, but uh, yeah. Uh, either way, it never ever targets the uh, the phantasmal image that's in play because that is an angel, that's an illegal target and it can't ever be declared that way. So there we go, that's that one. Um, slightly interesting case, sorry, yes, I, I have been corrected in the chat, thank you very much Gareth. The, the triggered ability does indeed go onto the stack but because there are no legal targets it just gets ripped straight back off again. It doesn't get countered, it just goes on the stack and comes off again. Ripped off. There we go. Skin shifter. Is not a particularly complex card, really, even though it does have, what, seven lines of text on it. And uh, there was a guy playing a skin shifter who had never read the last one. And you can imagine it, really. You, like, you look at skin shifter, it's got an activated ability, it costs green mana. You, it's a modal ability, you've got, you've got one of many choices. Until end of turn, skin shifter either becomes a 4 4 rhino and gains trample, or until end of turn, skin shifter becomes a 2 2 bird and gains flying, or until end of turn, Skin Shifter becomes a Nortec plant. Fine. That's the bit he remembered. He completely forgot so that you may only, in fact, activate this ability once per turn. Even when his opponent said, yeah, you can only do that once a turn, he went, really? What? No, it's just I choose one, I can turn it into one of these things. I was like, yeah, once per turn, right at the bottom of the card there. Um, the reason I thought this was interesting was because it kind of happened in front of me. Um, one of the players like activated skin shifter whilst I'd been talking to someone else uh, and the other like his opponent says no you, you can't do that you can only do it once per turn and um, the thought crossed my mind of like absolutely kind of technically has a game rule violation been committed at this point should I have given him a warning for doing so and um, my my personal belief is no that you, you don't do that um, the the opponent picked it up straight away and just said no you can't do that and this guy was like, oh, right, yeah, okay, fine. And there's the argument to say that he should have a warning um, is, that, um, is that he might have been trying to get away with it. He, he might have actually known that um, he's supposed to only activate it once per turn and just kind of thinking, well, you know, I get a nice, I get a, a small but very tangible advantage if I get to activate this another time. And maybe my opponent doesn't realise I can't do it. I'll, I'll just go ahead and do it, and I'll, I'll act dumb when uh, when he calls me on it, if indeed he does. Now, obviously, obviously we all know that that actual scenario would in fact be cheating. But it's very difficult indeed to, um, to tell the difference uh, between innocent mistakes and I'm going to savagely cheat by deliberately misreading my card and then acting dumb a moment later. Uh, mainly because there are a lot of dumb magic players out there. With no offence meant to the many talented magic players out there, but you've all seen people on coverage do ridiculous things, and they're the ones that are good enough to get onto the coverage. Um, all sorts of ridiculous errors happen in PTQs all the time. So, whilst yes, there's an argument that says warn him because you know he might have been trying to pull pull a fast one. There's another argument that kind of says, well, the opponent didn't care enough to um, 
to call a judge over. I just happened to be nearby and saw it happen. So do I really want to step in and give a warning that nobody really wanted me to give? Um, it's a tricky one, that one. I opted not to, and I just let them get on with their game. But uh, I thought it was just a, an interesting insight to what goes on up here during a PTQ through the whole day. The whole day this is going on. Um, I had another phantasmal image question shortly after, which had to do with this guy, I think. Ranker. So Ranker enchants a creature, and the enchanted creature gets plus two power, and it gets trample, and then there's this funky triggered ability that says, when Ranker is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, return Ranker to its owner's hands. So, well, this is an enchant creature. It's not an enchant creature you control, so, of course, it's perfectly plausible for you to Ranker up an opponent's creature. And if your opponent's got a phantasmal image sat on the other side of the table, that's quite a tempting prospect. Pay one green mana, rank it up my phantasmal image. Oops, was that targeting it? Oh, yes, it was. And uh, just as if I'd sneezed in his general direction, off he goes. Gets, uh, gets sacrificed as a result of his own trigger ability. So the question was, if I rank her up a uh, phantasmal image, will I get the ranker back? And in this case, no, absolutely not. Because rancor has to be put into a graveyard from the battlefield in order for its trigger ability to, to trigger. And if you target a phantasmal image with the rancor, the phantasmal image's trigger ability will go off, you'll sacrifice the phantasmal image. This all happens before the rancor has resolved. When you go to resolve the rancor, you realise, well, actually, there's no legal targets around, because the, well, the one I was targeting, it, it's not there anymore. So rancor gets countered and goes directly from the stack to the graveyard. It never made it to the battlefield. So, uh, because they haven't yet, I believe, printed a card that says when this would go into the graveyard from the stack, return it to your hand. Well, that's basically what buyback is, now that I think about it. You have to pay for that, though. Um, indeed, you may use Ranker to kill a Phantasmal image, but you don't get it back again. It's not card advantage as such. Um... Lone Revenant is one of a number of blue creatures that gave me issues over the weekend. Um, in this one, it wasn't down to the Hexproof one, it was again down to the Triggered Ability. I'll, I'll, just as an aside here, have you noticed how most of the questions that I'm talking about have, have had to do with triggers? Um, I hope you can understand why our missed trigger policy um, is quite so detailed as it is, quite so difficult to get your head around. Because there's a, a really there's a lot that happens in magic that falls under the, the, the broad umbrella of triggered abilities. And I they just aren't that well understood in general um by magic players. So determining what to do when they're missed, and they inevitably will be missed because nobody can concentrate for the twelve hours or so that the PTQ lasted for. Yes we 90 players, 12 hours. It wasn't wasn't my best day. Um, no one can concentrate for that long without making tiny mistakes. And if those tiny mistakes happen to be ones of a, of a legal nature and to do with trickery, then uh, well, you, you can be you can be stuffed pretty quickly. Um, so yes, going back to sorry, I've just realised I haven't paused my backup agent, and that caused me problems on a previous stream. So I've done that. Right, okay, technical issues dealt with. Um, let's get back to Lone Revenant. So, triggered ability. Whenever Lone Revenant deals combat damage to a player, if you control no other creatures, do some stuff. So, a guy's got two Lone Revenants out, which is so far not a mistake because they're not legendary. I like, uh, is it Geist of St. Trap? Is that the one I'm thinking about? Um, but, uh, Lone Revenant is not a legend, so it's perfectly fine to have two of them out. Perfectly fine to attack with two of them. However, it's really not a good idea to resolve the triggered ability of either of them if you do that. I mean, you've been attacking for eight. It's not not the worst of plays. But uh, yeah, what this guy did was having attacked with both Lone Revenants, he triggered one, so whenever Lone Revenant deals combat damage to a player if you control no other creatures, look at the top four cards of your library, put one on the hand, the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. So he did this. Then he was in the middle of resolving the second Lone Revenant trigger and then realised, or, or his opponent realised, that this really doesn't work that way. You can't do that. And in fact, we've, we're halfway through resolving a triggered ability that shouldn't ever have triggered 
and we already resolved another triggered ability, that shouldn't ever have triggered. What do we do about it? Well, what I did was I called this a game rule violation. And I gave the guy a warning for resolving some triggers that he wasn't supposed to. Um, and I opted to do my best to back up this situation. So I figured, well, the guy's looking at four cards. Well, it's quite easy to put them back on top of the library. But that's that undone. The other Lone Revenant ability uh, would have put um, something into his hand. And we didn't know for sure what card it was because it's not a revealed card. So um, the opponent didn't know. And whilst obviously the guy who controlled the Lone Revenant, he says, yeah, I know which card it was. It was this one. I'm not really going to believe him, am I? I'm not going to go, oh, yeah, obviously you put this useless land into your hand. Uh -huh. um, so I can't take his word for it as to which one went on there. So what I then did was, well, okay, one's gone into your hand, three have gone on the bottom of your library, so I'm going to take the three on the bottom, put them back on the top, and then realised there wasn't really much point to that, because what I'm actually going to do, we, we realised that um, some part of the library may well have been known because of, of earlier Lone Revenant triggers that were resolved correctly. Eventually we got to the point where we couldn't really work out what the state of the library should have been, so I opted to uh, put... I, I, I set the three cards that were on the bottom aside. I shuffled everything. Put the three cards back on top, and then took a random card out of the guy's hand and put that on top. So I knew that if I'd picked the wrong card to... Um, uh, if I picked the wrong card, and if I picked the card that he hadn't put into his hand with Lone Revenant, then I was only taking it away from him for one go. No, actually, no. Ah, oh, I'm talking complete garbage, aren't I? There's no way I, I didn't. I didn't set the other three cards aside. I just did a complete shuffle because he shouldn't have knowledge of what the top four cards of his library are. So that that would have, would have been really bad if I did that. Thank you for picking up on that. Of course, I didn't. I shuffled the entire library, but I put one random card from his hand back on top. Because he's up a card and he shouldn't be. So I need to take a card away. And I don't know which one it should be. So I take one at random. But the random one that I take away goes on top of the deck. The reason being that I don't know I've taken the correct card away. I might have denied him a card that he has, in fact, legitimately held on to for um, the whole of the game. And is trying to use it at some strategic moment. So the good side of doing it that way is that once the guy gets to his next draw step, he's drawn the card back again. He's now, he's had his hand restored. He's, he's back where he should be. Um, and this is kind of the, this is the simplest way to get the game back going again and fits very much in the, uh, the philosophy of how you deal with uh, extra drawn cards. Um, I'm interested to hear if uh, there, uh, there are guys in the chat that would have actually dealt with this a completely different way. So I'll give you the situation again because I kind of scrambled it my lack of recent experience of streaming. Two Lone Revenants attacked. One, right, they're both triggered. One trigger was fully resolved, and the other trigger, well, the guy was just looking at four cards when the error was noticed. What would you do at that point? I'm, I'm actually quite interested, and um, if you remind me later, I will, uh, I will um, pop that one up on the Magic Judge uh, UK forums and see if we can get a bit of a forum discussion going on about it, because that's a good one. Um, what else is here? What else is here? Da, 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 da. I got asked a question about this guy. There was Garrick was in play and he had three counters on him. And if he's got the triggered ability that says when he's got two or fewer loyalty counters on him, then he gets transformed. And uh, then Garrick Relentless deals three damage to target creature. That creature deals damage equal to its power to him. Um, there were a couple of Curse of Death's holdout, and I, it probably was a Restoration Angel. It was a 3-4. What other 3-4s um, are played in Standard at the moment? So Hero of something, something? That's a 3-4? Might have been one of those. So with two of these out, the guy had a 1-2. Had a and he said, he asked me the question, um, if Garrick shoots a 1-2, will it transform? And I was just sitting there thinking, what? What? Are you, what? what are you asking me? If Garrick shoots a 1-2, will it transform? And I figured out, eventually, that what the guy was asking, he, 
he kind of thought, well, if Garrick's going to deal three damage to something, then that creature's going to die, so it's not going to be around in order to deal damage back. I was like, no, they, they deal damage at the same time, then that one dies, and uh, Garrick takes damage, and because Garrick's taking damage, he loses loyalty counters, because that's how Planeswalkers... That's the result of dealing damage to Planeswalkers. So loyalty counter would gone, and that would cause the other trigger, and then I'd flip over. And I, I was just completely stunned by the question. It was just like, what are you asking me? And I was very... What was actually going on in my head was, am I coaching if I just straight up answer this? Um, but eventually figured, like, no, I think I get you. You're just going to hit that and flip. Yeah? Good? Brilliant. Fine. And the opponent didn't care about how I'd answered the question. But again, it's just it's just another insight to what goes on in a judge's head when you get asked an unclear question. You know you're at a competitive event. These people are playing for, for big prizes. I mean, the... The invitation to the Pro Tour is not a trivial matter by any stretch. Um, they've paid 20 quid, wasn't it? Was it a 20 pound tournament? They paid 20 quid to be here. Um, at the very least, there's 15 Planeswalker points going on this match. That's that's the very least. There's a whole bunch of boosters. There's four boosters per player in the pool. I think that, that seemed to go down quite well. That looked quite nice at the end. See, 10 boxes of prizes being handed out. Um, so yeah, it's not a trivial matter. And at competitive rules enforcement level, I definitely shouldn't be coaching the opponent. And this all flashes through your head, and you've got to deal with that question in your own head in an instant, whilst at the same time trying to work out what question's actually being asked and what the actual answer is. So yes, eventually, whilst time seems to slow down when I'm thinking about these things, and I'm sure I took longer to spit the final ruling out than I necessarily needed to, but eventually I just got to, yeah, if Garrick shoots a 1-2, it will, it'll take one damage, and yes, it will transform. The guy came up to me very kind of apologetically afterwards, and I think he realised what the problem was with his somewhat ambiguous question. But um, yeah, insight into a judge's mind again there. This card is a land with an activated ability. This card is a land with an activated ability. These are not the same card. These are not the same card. And somebody activated the Ghost Quarter and started looking through his library and, I think, fetched an island out, put the island into play. And the other guy was like, what are you doing? Uh, what are you targeting with the Ghost Quarter? And he was like, what? I thought it was an evolving world. Oh, no. Awkward. Judge! Which is exactly the right thing to do at that point. Something's gone wrong, you call a judge, you get the judge involved. You try to work out what's gone wrong. Because, as I've said many, 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 many times, your opponent doesn't have any obligation whatsoever to help you beat him. So, um, it's generally not a good idea to try and work out with your opponent what you should do about the fact that you just accidentally activated a ghost quarter instead of an evolving world. I'll tell you the approach I took with this one. Um, ghost quarter has an activated ability that targets. It's been activated without uh, having a target being declared. Um, therefore, it's been activated illegally, so I can give the guy a warning for a game rule violation for just doing the ability wrong and rewind the whole thing. So I'll put the island back in the library, shuffle it, because I've got no way of restoring after the shuffle that's been done anyway, um, and then put the Ghost Quarter back on the table. Um, some people would possibly think that the correct solution would be to say, well, you've activated the Ghost Quarter, you better choose a target now. Um, I don't think that is a correct resolution to this problem. Um, the guy's messed up, obviously, yes, um, but I think it's fairer on both players if you rewind to the ghost court being in play rather than say well you've legally activated the ability you just haven't declared a target yet i chose to interpret it as he illegally activated the ability and should therefore go right back to uh the start of the announcement does that make sense to you guys do you think that's fair i mean obviously if you're the other side of the table you want him to activate his ghost quarter if you're uh, if you've got any kind of competitive spirit in you at all um, yeah, seems fair, doesn't it? 
doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, just addressing a couple of things that have come up in the chat. Couldn't I ask him to rephrase the question with Garrick Relentless? Um, yes, I probably could. Um, but, well, this whole thing happened in the space of about four or five seconds. So whilst I'm, you know, I'm, I'm being very kind of explicit about what goes on in my head when I get asked a bit of a fuzzy question um, in actual elapsed time, whilst it looks like I've kind of been slapped in the face and I, I have this stunned face on where I'm just like, what am I even thinking? You've also got to ask yourself the question, am I even giving something away by asking him to rephrase the question? Well, that goes through your head as well. And then I was like, uh, no, I'm pretty sure I'm just in the clear here. Yeah, let's go ahead. The annoying thing about asking people to rephrase questions is they don't necessarily understand why their question was bad in the first place and how they should rephrase it in order to get the answer they want. And that can make dealing with a judge a very frustrating experience, um, which is the opposite of what I really want to happen. Obviously, I, I'm trying to encourage people to call judges all the time. Um, there's a certain amount of reluctance among some players to call judges. Um, some people think that calling a judge to say, hey, my opponent's just screwed up, is in some way like, unsporting. They don't want their opponent to get a penalty for no particularly good reason. So they, they don't want to be the, be the douche that's like, judge, my, you messed up. Um, so I want to encourage people to call judges all the time because you'll get the fairest fix to your, your problem that way. So if you're confused about how something's going to happen, it's only logical that you're going to call the judge before you do it, rather than do it and then ask if it's going to work, which um, which happened on at least one occasion. I don't think I wrote down. Oh, that's awkward. Um, oh, no, I think it was another Restoration Angel question, which I'm coming to later. Um, but yes, it, it makes sense to ask before you're about to do something. Um, rather than do something, then ask a judge, and then realise you've done it wrong and be held to a particularly bad play. Um, so yes, you definitely can ask people to rephrase the question. That is the thing you can do, and in many cases that does work. Um, I don't like doing it because I make people feel stupid um, unnecessarily. I mean, if they're being stupid, then that's another thing entirely. Um, one question I also had a, a fair bit of difficulty resolving was to do with fresh meat. Um, I think this this guy had a couple of mana creatures, quite a few mana creatures, so, you know, like Birds of Paradise and that, that, that lot, um, who were about to die in combat, and he didn't have much mana available. Um, yeah, they were blocking. He didn't have much land up. Um, so the only way he could afford to cast fresh meat was if he tapped the Birds of Paradise, the other mana creatures that were in combat to generate mana. And it was like, what happens to the mana? How can I... Can I cast fresh meat using the mana that I've tapped um, from the guys that are going to die in combat? And we, we eventually, with a little bit of toing and froing, worked out that well, the only way you could cast fresh meat off of the mana from the creatures that are in play is to tap them and cast the spell in the same combat step, at which point nothing's going to have died, so casting it, there's not really much point. Um, so I, I tried to answer very generically, I was like, yeah, uh, mana empties from your mana pool at every step, so uh, if you create mana at the um, in the declare blockers step, then it won't be there for you to use in the combat damage step. They were like, well, can I make the mana in the combat damage deck? I mean, no, because the combat damage is already resolved at that point and your creatures are in the graveyard, so activating their mana abilities is a thing you can't do. And we eventually got to there like, okay, so the only way I could cast fresh meat is to do it in declare blockers. Yes. And if I do that, I'm not going to get any tokens. That's also right. So we got there in the end without me explicitly saying there's no point in you casting fresh meat. Like, you can't cast fresh meat to get tokens. It's, this is just not a possible thing. Um, which, again, I don't even think is that close to um, uh, to coaching to say that there's actually there's no way to do what you're trying to do, so just, like, drop it. Um, but, I don't know, I, I educated somebody about when mana pool's empty. So maybe they'll um, go to a future PTQ and they'll know how it all works and their opponent will try something and they'll be like, ah, ha ha, that doesn't work. And because of that fantastic and rather attractive judge, Paul Smith, that uh, 
sorted it out. You know, the, the guy with the beard. Yeah. That's me. This is another blue creature that I had a problem with over the weekend. Um, Augur of Bolas. Why did I have a problem with Augur of Bolas? Well, actually, to be fair, I didn't have a problem with Augur of Bolas, but uh, a number of players did. Um, there's a very big, fat, long triggered ability that says, when Augur of Bolas enters the battlefield, look at the top three cards of your library. You may reveal an instant or sorcery card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Yes, uh, the Augur of Ponder, as it's being called in the chat. I like that. Um, except it's not quite Ponder, is it? Because you only get instants and sorceries from your deck with it. And whilst your deck might be 90% instants or sorceries, well, the non-lands anyway, if you're playing something like Delver, and it might think you might think it automatic that you can just pick the card and put it into your hand, well, that's actually not a thing you can do. Um, if you want to put a card in your hand, it must be an instant or sorcery. In order to prove that uh, you're making a legal play of putting a card in your hand, you have to reveal it in order to prove it really is an instant or sorcery. And if you don't, you're going to get a penalty. And the infraction is called failure to reveal, which is exactly so worded as it's, it covers the, the quite narrow play instance of when you didn't reveal something that you were required to reveal in order to prove that an action you just took was in fact legal. And if you don't do that, well, that's a game loss. Failure to reveal is a game loss. So uh, I thought they had shied away of printing like walking game losses in core sets, but uh, there you are. There's an uncommon blue creature in M13 that is going to cause a lot of game losses, I would imagine. Very easy to do by accident, and there really isn't much in the way of provisions to downgrade this. There is a possibility, I believe it's it's downgradable if um, someone casts Augur of Bolas um, with an empty hand, and they go and put a card in their hand, and it's the only card that's in their hand. So it's quite simple to go, hang on a minute mate, you're supposed to reveal that. Oh, it is obviously this card, reveal it, fine. Get a warning for failure to reveal, I'm not going to give you the game loss because, well, you can't possibly have gained any advantage from that. More to the point, if someone Augur of Bolas with an empty hand, they put the one card in their hand, their opponent realises that they've done a failure to reveal, but they're like, ha, oh, there's only one card in hand, that's a bit awkward. Well, tell you what, I'll wait until later when he might have more than one card in his hand, and as soon as he draws another card, go, oh, you didn't reveal to Augur of Bolas. Well, in that instance, the judge is still not going to reward you with a game loss, because it, it was uniquely identifiable at a point. There was a point in which you could have called the judge and the guy had only got a warning. So we're still only going to give him a warning for it because you're trying to manipulate the, the results by calling the judge at a, at a favourable time for you. Sorry, back onto the... Just have a bit of a drink. So I realise my voice is cracking. It is, uh, it's not your speakers. Ah, yes, so... If your opponent fails to reveal to Augur Bolas, call a judge straight away. If they're incredibly lucky and have an empty hand at the time, they might get away with just a warning, but otherwise it's, it's game losses all round. And I think this is probably going to happen a lot um, this PTQ season. Um, it, I'm being complained at in the chat because all my examples are coming from the same uh, play group of players. I didn't actually realise that at the time. Um, I literally wrote down everything that happened um, that I was directly involved with. I didn't actually get much... Uh, much um, after, after round two, actually... It all kind of dies down a bit, almost certainly, because Pip and Andrew are back on the floor and they were dealing with things so well uh, without having to involve me. Um, that level of gamesmanship where you kind of deliberately delay um, in order to... Uh, like deliberately delay calling a judge in order to try to get a better penalty um, is it, exactly why we have things like a failure to maintain game state being a warning for you if you allow your opponent to commit like game rule violations. Um, can you get failure to maintain game state for allowing a failure to reveal to persist? I don't think you can actually, now that I think about it. If this was done absolutely deliberately and you knew this was done absolutely deliberately, um, you could very much uh, disqualify the player. Um, but it's going to be a tricky one to latch onto, that one. And unless a player basically admits that that's what they did, that's quite hard 
to um, catch someone in the middle of, I think. Um, there was a question about gutter grime. I've completely forgotten the question. Gutter grime was out and someone wiped the board somehow. Um, gutter grime says, whenever a non-token you control dies, you put a slime counter on gutter grime and then you put a green ooze creature token onto the battlefield with this creature's power and toughness are equal to the number of slime counters on gutter grime. So what actually happens is you put one counter on and then you put a 1-1 one, one into play, and then you put another counter on, and then you put a 2-2 two, two into play, but the guy who was originally a 1-1 one, one becomes a 2-2, two, two because the ability, this creature's power and toughness, are each equal to the number of slime counts on gutter grime, is a, a static ability that's continuously um, evaluated. You, you're, just, you're always going, how many, are on, how many counters are on there? If the number of counters changes, then the, uh, the guy's... Um, sorry... The guy's power and toughness changes at the same time. It would be different if it said this creature's... Sorry, if it said put a green ooze creature token onto the battlefield with power and toughness equal to X, where X is the number of uh, count, slime counters on gutter grime. That would be a fixed thing that you calculated once at the point you put the token into play. This isn't a fixed thing. You're actually granting this ability to the creature. So the creature has what's known as a characteristic defining ability that's continuously evaluating its power and toughness as you go along. So, at the end of it, you know, if you had five guys that just got wrathed away, then you're going to end up with five five fives in play, as long as they weren't tokens in the first place. Which is pretty cool. Definitely pretty cool. Um, this card, does this card go in a pod deck? It feels like it could. It's a five mana, though. Doesn't quite seem worth it. Not sure. Not sure on that one at all. Um, speaking of pods, here's another pod. It's a mortar pod. Mortar pod gave me a, a problem because the guy played mortar pod and didn't put a germ token into play. He didn't do anything really to signify that the mortar pod had something attached to it, which was well, not a problem straight away. Maybe, except he passed the turn. His opponent attacked. And then he sacrificed the germ that wasn't actually there in order to give uh, deal one damage to an attacking, I think it was a Birds of Paradise that had a power boost from somewhere, I'm not entirely sure. At which point the opponent goes, wait, you don't have a germ there, you can't sacrifice a germ you don't have, you miss the mortal pod's trigger. Ah, ah, those immortal worlds. Because missed triggers are difficult things to deal with these days. The, the policy is still uh, embedding in in people's minds. Um, but we have told people, you are never responsible for reminding your opponents of their triggers. And Living Weapon is a triggered ability. Um, the reminder text is pretty close to what it does. When this equipment enters the battlefield, put a naught naught black germ creature token onto the battlefield, then attach this to it. Now, if you know a little bit about lapsing abilities, you might know that an ability that a triggered ability that puts a permanent into play under your control is uh, considered lapsing. Um, so I'm trying to think of an example Blade Splicer that just chucks a 3 3 golem into play for you, doesn't it, when it comes to play? If you put the Blade Splicer, spl blade splicer into play and you don't put the golem out, then you've missed its trigger. Uh, if you sacrifice a Thrag Tusk and you don't put the 3 3 beast, I'm clutching here. Tell me if I get it wrong. Um, if you don't put the 3-3 beast in play after you sacrifice the Tusk, you miss the trigger. Um, because they're considered to be uh, lapsing, then you you won't get that. However, Mortopod is not entirely a lapsing ability because whilst one of the things it does is it puts a 0-0 germ into play, another thing it does is equips the Mortopod to it. Now, this has actually led to quite a lot of discussion in the, in the judge community. Does that tiny, tiny little detail that it equips a mortar pod to it um, stop it being lapsing? Now, by a strict reading of like the technical definition of a lapsing ability, a lapsing ability is, is something that does one of these many things and nothing else. And attaching an equipment is not one of the lapsing abilities. So as a judge, you go, well, part of this ability isn't lapsing, therefore the whole thing isn't lapsing. Therefore, we give you a warning for missing a trigger, but we do ultimately put the germ in play. 
There are people who argue, though, that attaching the equipment, well, attaching an equipment, that's got to be beneficial, surely. Really? Why would attaching one of your own equipment to one of your own guys ever be a bad thing to do? Oh, okay, I can reach uh, far enough to try to work out the odd occasion where it's really bad to um, equip something. In much the same way that I can reach, and if I really wanted to, I could make it bad for you to draw a card. Such as if you're playing against a milling deck, that can happen. Um, yeah, if it's a skull clamp and your own man's going to die and you don't want to draw two cards, then sure, but yeah, I mean, that's a stretch, isn't it, really? I see you poking your tongue out at me there. I, I know what you're thinking. It's exactly what we talked about at the weekend. So, by a strict technical definition, this is not a lapsing ability. So, I said, as it's been discovered within the turn cycle, I give him a warning from his trigger, but I do put the germ in play and I do equip it. So it is there to be sacrificed and it does kill the thing. And the opponent's slightly unhappy about this, but ultimately, you know, that's final ruling, that's how it happens. Um, wouldn't be 100% surprised if that changes again at some point in the future, but right now, that is the correct answer. Um, what other things happened? Um, Oh, I'm just reading through my notes because I don't have many cards. My last card I've got is another Restoration Angel. I'm just trying to remember what happened with the Restoration Angel again. Uh, this was somebody quite late in to round seven who blocked, uh, then, then flashed in a Restoration Angel and then wanted to block with the Restoration Angel. And I had to say, well, no, you've already blocked. You only get one opportunity to declare blockers in your turn, and I have to take it that you have declared blockers when you've declared this one creature as a as a blocker. Um, mainly because there was some time in between the blocking and the restoration angel being announced. It's possible you can apply something called out of order sequencing to say, no, no, no you you've got to play the restoration angel in the declare attacker step. But as you're kind of doing everything all in one motion, we can say, okay. Play the resto at the point you're supposed to in the declare attacker step and then go and do your blockers. But because there was a, a bit of time in between here, I, I felt like the guy may possibly have been fishing for responses. And one of the main ideas behind this, this out of order sequencing philosophy that was once upon a time known as, uh, as ruling by intent, is that the guy who plays sloppily shouldn't get any advantage out of doing so. And if you think he's possibly fishing for responses, you can go, uh, no, this isn't this isn't going to happen. Now, what he actually wanted to do was block, yeah, and blink the blocker, and then block another creature with that guy, and also block the Restoration Angel. So what he actually wanted to do was was even far worse um, than what I what I've explained just then, and that's why I held him to his original declaration of blockers rather than going whoa, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. Let's give you another stab at getting this right. I've just figured, no. Round seven of a, of a PTQ. Um, if you don't know how your Restoration Angel works, well, you're going to learn the hard way, I'm afraid. See, I do have a harsh bone in my body. It does happen. Right, what else was on these notes? I had a couple of things. There were some deck problems in the, in the day. Um... One deck list was handed in with only 59 cards. That pretty much happens every tournament. There was a lot of abbreviations, a lot of abbreviated names of cards on the deck lists. And some people got away with it because they happened to abbreviate their cards in a way that was either acceptable, in that they'd written Gideon and not Gideon Jura, which is fine because we have a specific exception for like storyline characters. Planeswalkers and Legends can be referred to by their short name on, on the deck list as long as it's unique. Um, and some people kind of lucked out by happening to put um, enough of a card name down that there was the only one in standard that it could possibly apply to. But other people weren't quite so um, lucky. I think someone had a zealous in their sideboard, um, which could have been zealous conscripts or it could have been zealous strike. I think they were the two cards that we found that had zealous in the name. Um, and the deck had access to red mana and the deck had access to white mana. So... There's no way for me to say which one it is. Um, 
speaking of deck problems, there was one very, very large deck problem that happened in round four, I think, round five, maybe. Um, one player went to go to play his match and couldn't find his deck. And in fact, his deck had disappeared entirely. Um, what was weird is that we, we think he left his deck uh, and notepad on top of a play mat on his table and he'd walked off and done something. And somebody... Nobody owned up to it in the end. Somebody handed in the playmat. But no deck and no notepad. And right to the very end of the day, they were never found. So I have to entertain the possibility that it was in fact stolen by a malicious member of the PTQ, which would make me very sad indeed if that was true. Um, but I can't honestly think of any other way that this could have happened at this point. Um, still... We tried our best to keep the player going in the tournament, and it worked out like this. Um, he was playing a Delverish kind of deck, I think, some, some variation on Delver. One of his friends was also playing Delver and was paired up against another friend. Um, so they'd heard what happened. They resolved their match straight away by one of the friends conceding to the other. Um, I think it was the, the guy who had the better match record at the time got the win for that match. And then took apart his deck, um, just gave it to the guy whose deck had been lost and said, look, rebuild your deck from this. We fished out the guy's deck list and they were pretty close, but he had to find the other cards. And it turned out that you know he was friends with the dealer that was on site, so this was vaguely possible. And he got his deck together. Um, now, I'm thinking about being as sympathetic to the guy that, uh, as I possibly can, because having your deck stolen is no way to exit a tournament. Um, but at the same time, I've got to be fair to the guy he's playing against. I've got to be fair to the tournament as a whole. Um, so once three minutes had passed, which was always going to, there was no way he was going to get the deck together in that time, I knew I was uh, going to have to issue him a game loss for tardiness, for not being ready to play. And technically, at 10 minutes, I should have given a second game loss for tidiness. As it was, I at the 10-minute mark, I looked up to see how close he was to building his deck. Um, he wasn't very far off. Got to nearly like 11 minutes. Had his main deck done. Didn't have his sideboard done yet. I said, let's go sit down. You've got to play... Uh, you're, you're, you're playing main deck now anyway. So... Just go ahead, sit down, play your main deck, let these guys sort your sideboard out if you go to a game three. As it turned out, he sat down, he won his game two, he sideboarded, he won his game three, and everything was fine. Um, other than the fact the deck was still missing. Uh, they then took the remainder of that round to piece together the, the whole of the other deck. Um, and... Um, Whilst it was a, a, a very sad incident indeed, um, I think we made the best of what we could um, and, got, and kept the guy in the tournament. Uh, I'm being asked in the chat, wouldn't this fall under the 10 minutes to find the replacements and then play a normal match? Huh. Have I missed something? Did I not need to give him a game loss? I figured out I had to for not being ready. Like explained by Kevin in his article, Oh dear, oh dear. Have I have I misrepresented a, a Kevin Defray article here? Um, can someone link me? Um, hang on, I'm going to turn. I don't think I've turned links on. I'm allowing links. Uh, links in modes enable. Can someone link me to Kevin's article so I can see if that is a, a possibility? Because um, if he he was indeed at the table and absolutely knew what was going on, but just had. His deck stolen. I'm, I'm scrolling down here. So this is quite good. This is on... Wow, I'm learning some things in my own stream. Thank you very much, guys. So this is on www.internationalmagicjudges.net uh, slash article hyphen 1777. Uh, you can probably Google for it by Googling for tardiness uh, Kevin Depre. Uh, Kevin, K-E-V-I-N, and Depre is D-E-S-P-R-E-Z. Um, why... That it goes into the philosophy behind tardiness. Uh, why is tardiness even an infraction at all? Understanding the penalty, 
understanding the range of application. Ah. Do, do, do. Do, 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 do. So this is talking about the fact that reading tardiness, this should be an immediate game loss and the player has 10 minutes to find replacements. That sounds very much like what I did. But that contradicts with an example from the slow play section because if you were after three minutes into a round at, at PTQ, you haven't completed your shuffling, well, then we would have committed slow play, and that's only worth a warning. So, huh. Judges should be seen as benefits to players. Players should not be afraid to call the judge when one is required. This, this seems good. The solution also lies in the IPG. If a player commits an offence, realises it, and calls the judge over immediately before he could potentially benefit from the event, the offence, the head judge has the option to downgrade the penalty without it considered being deviation. Yeah, that seems perfectly plausible too. So, yeah, we get to once the judge has finished identifying the missing cards from the player's deck, that player's got 10 minutes to find them, or at that point would have to receive a match loss for tidiness. If he does manage to find them, then he receives a warning with a downgraded penalty for tidiness. Huh. Well, in which case, I am very sorry to the guy who did manage to rebuild his uh, deck that I did give him a game loss, which I apparently didn't have to. I thought I did. Um, I made a mistake there. And I also apologise to Kevin Depre for uh, not internalising that part of his recent article. It's a very, very good article. Um, I'm really enjoying the, the series, actually. There's a whole series of articles on the philosophy behind uh, a certain infraction in the IPG. Kevin's articles on tardiness. There are other articles uh, in there um, about different infractions. Um, the question is, how long did the player take to sit down and present his deck? Well, he was at the table right at the start of the round because he was just like straight away, I don't have my deck, where is it gone? Um, and we were something like 12... We were, no, we were 11 minutes into the round when the guy had put his deck together, which, given that, like it would have taken... a me a minute to figure what cards were missing so yeah I apologize profusely if you're watching this then uh, I should only have given you a warning not game loss as it turns out it didn't matter because the guy went on to win that match 2-1 don't know what happened to him in the rest of the tournament but um, it was a, a horrible situation to be part of to be honest and I'm very much disheartened by the idea that uh, it may have been a thief uh, in our midst that caused quite such an uproar um, other things that happened one guy was seen separating his deck into land and spells and then kind of shuffling them together separately and then shuffling them together in an attempt to mana weave now his opponent called me over he stuck his arm up in the air said judge called me over and explained exactly what he just saw but he did it whilst the guy was still shuffling so there's an interesting one is it illegal to mana weave? In theory, no, it's not illegal to mana weave, but it doesn't do you any good because having mana weaved, you're supposed to then shuffle sufficiently that you would have destroyed any pattern that you just weaved in. And therefore, if you shuffled sufficiently, there's no infraction for you, but you just destroyed the point of mana weaving in the first place. Um, now, I was called over whilst the guy was kind of in the middle of mana weaving. So has an offence been committed? And I ruled no, nothing wrong has been done here, even though if the manner weaving had continued and the guy had presented his deck in a like designed state, then he would have been guilty of uh, manipulation of game materials, which is disqualifiable offence. Um, this was another like slightly hard call to make, um, but I very much got the, the idea um, just kind of reading the guy who the guy who put his hand up and called the judge was a friend of mine, and I very much got the idea that he was calling the judge, calling me over um, as soon as the guy was mana weaving, exactly so that I didn't have to disqualify him. All he wanted was a fair game where the uh, the decks were shuffled fairly. Um, but it's an interesting one. Would you DQ somebody if you were called over before they technically presented their deck? If the guy really did think his opponent was cheating, have I just screwed him over by not giving the ruling because, like, he called the judge too soon? I'm very interested to know in the chat what you think about that one because that one could very much go either way. 
Um, I did explain to him, uh, having been called, that he, he, it is under his, it, it's very much his um, responsibility to shuffle his deck thoroughly and make sure he did so. Um, the fact is, the player, the original player, called the judge and said, hey, on this guy's manner weaving at the table, and, and very much <laughs> told his opponent, hey, you're doing this thing that you're not allowed to do, rather than calling a judge and talking to me away from the table and saying, hey, uh, hang on, I think my opponent's mana weaving, in which case I would have done exactly as suggested in the chat, which is just kind of watch the um, uh, watch the match from afar uh, and see exactly what he does and when he presents, make a call then as to whether he's manipulated or not. But the fact is, I was called over and I had the situation explained to me at the table in front of the guy, so I don't think I had any option but to go like, yeah, okay, what this guy says is true. What you're doing, you're not allowed to do because you've got to shuffle appropriately. Um, yeah. I think I think the difference between what's being said in, in the chat and, and what I did is what the, the guy calling the judge did. He explained why manor weaving was a bad thing at the table in his opponent's earshot. Um, so what... What I did in the course of my ruling was just to say, well, no, you, you can't do this. You haven't technically committed an infraction yet, but if you presented your deck like this, you would be disqualified. Make sure you shuffle your, your deck appropriately, please. Um, and then watched him for, like, for the rest of the day, just made sure he wasn't reverting to his old ways. And I'm happy to uh, report that he didn't. Very much the case that if somebody had told me, I think my opponent is cheating, can you watch him to see if he is cheating, um, and had done it in such a way that he hadn't alerted the opponent at all to what was going on, then yeah, I'd be like surreptitiously watching. And if he presents with a stacked deck, then he's getting a trip out of the tournament. It's a tough call. Um, I think I was particularly kind of affected by the fact that I knew the guy who called the judge. I know he. I, I know, uh, I didn't just know the guy, I mean, he's one of my best friends, um, and I know that he's the kind of guy that will call a judge over, not because he wants his opponent to get a penalty, but just because he wants the game to proceed fairly, and um, I think he thought his opponent was was a bit of a noob and really didn't want the, the bam hammer to come down on him, so. <laughs> um, what else have I got? I've done deck problems, I've done the mana weaving Thing. I've gone through all the card issues that I had. Um, there was an interesting one where somebody found a card midway through game three of a match, and then the guys that realised that well, he must have presented an illegal deck, so he's going to get a game loss for having presented a fifty-nine card deck for this game, which is going to end the match because this is game three. But the guy, the, the opponent, then was like, I don't want to win that way. Looks at the board, realises he's actually about to lose and wants to concede. There's a kind of an interesting philosophical discussion here of like, can you concede quickly enough to stop the penalty happening? And uh, this kind of swung uh, different ways over time. But what I eventually ruled was that a match isn't over until a match has been signed. So... He's getting his game loss. He gets it right now. Um, that's going to end the match 2-1 in your favour. But you're allowed, having won the match, to concede it straight away and put down on the result slip that you lost it 2-1. Um, the guy's still going to get his game loss. He's still going to get entered in the computer for what happened. But you're effectively nullifying it by conceding, which... Yeah, we figured. I figured before it's kind of a customer service thing. If if somebody wants to concede because they don't like like the way a, a ruling's gone their way and they don't feel like they deserved it, I don't think I can really take that away from them. It's like being overly sporting. You're allowed to do it. Um, and that's it. Yes, that is pretty much everything of interest that happened at the Peter Kieran Cardiff. Apart from the fact that we had a ridiculously late start and late finish. We had a 70-minute long quarterfinal and a 90-minute long semi-final. Um, 
which was a little bit awkward, but well, it happens. We don't even really think slow play was was happening. There were some very complicated uh, t- uh, game states, um, three game matches. Uh, there was lots of back and forth in each of the games. There, it, there was a lot of magic going on that day. Um, it's possible they were crossing the line into slow play. I have to admit, I was spending a lot of my time during the semi-finals um, uh, going over Andrew's level 2 test, and I'd kind of left the top 8 in, in Pip's hands. Um, maybe a more experienced judge would have given a few more pieces of encouragement, little, little nudges to say, come on, get moving, get moving, you need to play now. Maybe not gone as far as a slow play warning, but just said, come on guys, you've had X minutes, keep it going. Maybe that would have helped, but you know, as it happens, if we had timed them, if you had timed uh, top eight, um, sorry, I should say at this point, the TO had announced that um, the rounds uh, in the top eight would be untimed, so I had no choice really but to go with that original announcement. Um, if you do time them, you traditionally time the quarterfinals to 60 minutes, uh, the semis to 90, and leave the finals untimed. So the fact that it went 70, 90 and untimed is actually in line with if we timed them. So I'm not too fussed. It, I did get out late, but no one seemed to mind. Everyone seemed to be having a good time. And Stephen Murray even found somewhere to sleep for the night. So that was good. Um, for those asking in the chat, yeah, the, the final was a pod mirror. Um, and George Newbold from Exeter, I think, he won. So, uh, yeah, it was it was an interesting final. Um was quite awkward when both players mulliganed five in game three of the final and you're like ah okay i'm being asked in the chat i'd like to go back to the revenant thing please go ahead Stephen. what would you like to know about the lone revenant thing let's put the lone revenant back up so i'm being asked in the chat what would happen if it was say two scroll thieves and i hate to admit that i'm going to have to look up scroll thief um, because I don't immediately know what that does. Um, so you're saying that for some reason it, it shouldn't have triggered, but it did. Let's see if I can, can I load this in live? Scroll thief. Scroll thief. Why can't I spell thief? I was going to get the I and E the wrong way around. Um, so if we had... Scroll Thief. When Scroll Thief do a combat damage to a player, you draw a card. Um, hmm. This one's almost certainly going to be drawing extra cards, which would be a game loss. Um, the difference, in my mind, between uh, the Lone Revenant and the Scroll Thief example that you've just given me, um, is it's a kind of a technicality in the, in the definition of the drawing extra cards in Fraction. Um, if you, do, if you commit drawing extra cards, generally speaking, you get a game loss. Now, the problem is that by, by, by its definition, drawing extra cards is the infraction that you've committed if all you do is draw an extra card. That's the, the only thing that you do. Um, one of the reasons it's a game loss is because of the, the potential for abuse, like the the amount of um, advantage it gives you to have an extra card. Like, uh, whole articles have been written about card advantage. Having an extra card is obviously a very, very good thing. That's part of the reason why drawing extra cards is a game loss. The other reason that drawing extra cards is a game loss is that it can happen very quickly and it can be very difficult for your opponent to realise that you've done it. Um, so that feeds into the potential for abuse. You can, you can do it accidentally you can do it very quickly, you can get away with it, and um, the, uh, the the opponent doesn't really have much chance to notice. Now, if they happen to notice, all of those factors combined is what leads to drawing extra cards being a game loss. Now, technically, it's not drawing extra cards if a game rule violation happened before that, which means that the opponent could have spotted what was going wrong. Um, so to give you an example, if you cast uh, Tidings, is it Tidings I'm thinking of? That like uh, two double blue, three double blue, draw some cards. What is it? Tidings. 
three double blue, draw four cards. If you cast Tidings for its correct mana cost, and you drew five cards, that's a very difficult thing to spot. Because four cards, five cards, they look quite similar. If you do it quickly, you're just kind of palming them off the top of the deck. So if you cast Tidings, draw five cards, that's drawing extra cards, you're going to get a game loss. Assuming you get caught. That's, that's kind of the whole point. Getting caught at this is very tricky. If you cast Tidings without having double blue mana available, you had five mana, but you didn't have the double blue. And what you do is you announce Tidings, and then your opponent lets it resolve, and then you draw the cards. Now, the mistake you made was that you cast Tidings for the wrong mana cost. The result, a little bit later, was that you ended up with cards in your hand that you shouldn't have. But we've swayed away from calling that drawing extra cards, because, well, if the opponent had called the judge at the point that you cast Tidings without the double blue mana, then you would have only got a warning. And you got a warning for casting a spell with the wrong mana. And it would be a game more violation, and we'd try and back it up, and we'd apply all the policy that we normally apply to those kind of mistakes. What we don't want to encourage you to do is realise that the Tidings was cast wrongly, then wait, let it resolve, have the guy draw his four cards, then go, wait, you don't have double blue up, call the judge, and be rewarded for waiting those extra couple of seconds by your opponent being given a gain loss instead of a warning. And with Lone Revenant, it's pretty much the same thing. You don't just put a card in your hand, you pick four up. You... If Lone Revenant